back to the Scarlet Faithful podcast, the only podcast that covers Rucker sports on a daily basis. You got nine episodes last week. We're on to a new week. Monday, March 11th, Rutgers now the 13th seed in the Big Ten tournament. Lost six of its last seven regular season games, ending the regular season with a losing record for the first time in five years. Wanted to discuss comments from head coach Steve Peichel after the game. I've touched on the offseason a little bit and the roster Morris coming out now, just in terms of Pykele talking about his approach. So I think it's important to cover. And there's going to be – it's going to be a very exciting and roller coaster of a ride of an offseason coming up. And uh, I really hope this current team can make a little bit of a run this week at the Big Ten tournament. But at the same time, I think it's fair to start looking ahead also. And uh, you're seeing more and more of that just in terms of – uh, how it's being addressed. So Steve Peichel specifically talking after the game on senior day uh, when asked by Jerry Carino uh, about roster construction and his approach. And I quote, you've got to change the timeline of kids making decisions, comma myself, meaning his approach to it as well. You can't have guys in June, July, August deciding it's hard to replace people. I've got to do a really good job of managing that and finding out who's going to be on board and who's not. He goes on to say, you can't control the portal. You can't control NIL. What you can do is stay the course, get kids in the program who want to work, kids who want to be at Rutgers. But I think you can do a better job of finding out who's staying, Peichel said. When those opportunities come late, are they going to stay the course with you? He goes on to say, you don't have a lot of control. I wish we had a little bit more. I wish the timeline to transfer was more restrictive, but it's not going to change anytime soon. So we just have to manage it. And I have to do an excellent job of managing the roster. So Steve Peichel, I think it's very telling. It's obviously some recognition of what happened in the offseason, getting blindsided by the late departures of Cam Spencer and Paul Mulcahy. Seen a lot of commentary, uh, you know, among fans on social media about that. And I know, you know, it hasn't been uh, the most popular uh, concept. And, and I've, I've discussed it just in terms of how that's really impacted uh, this year's roster. Um, but I think the most important takeaway from all of Michael's comments is that it appears he's adapting. And that is a must in this day and age. And I think the other thing is that things are changing so rapidly. You know, NIL... Uh, has only been around a couple of years, uh, it's two or three years now. Um, you know, you have the portal. Um, people seem to be surprised that over, you know, 50, last year there were about 50% in the portal. There's going to be a lot more this year. I mean, I, sounds like, I mean, 75 to 80% is going to be what people are expecting this year. And I, I touched on this in my re- rapid reaction last night, but uh, it's about value. It's, it's, it's about projected value. Right. It, it, it's still going to be about fit to a degree. Uh, and some people are going to leave for the old fashioned reasons of, you know, more playing time, better fit, um, you know, maybe dropping down a, a level just because uh, they're better fit for that. But players that in the, I think the biggest difference is players that normally in the past would have stayed in a particular program are going to explore their options. And exploring their options is measuring their value on the open market. And that is, I think was a big motivating factor. And I reported the day Cam Spencer went in the portal that, that it was NIL driven and in large part because his value went up after the early entry deadline for the NBA draft was over. And once he was the, the pool of transfers got smaller and his value went up. And that's partly with Paul Mulcahy as well. His value went up. And that is, I think, still going to be a concern with anyone uh, and any program. But Rutgers got burned more than most. Yeah, you know, should I say burned more than any other program? I mean, I, I can't say for sure, but certainly they're up there. And uh, it's a huge lesson 
not just for Rutgers, but for college coaches everywhere. And it appears that Steve Peichel has taken it seriously. And I think you're going to see a lot of activity very quickly with this current roster in terms of decisions being made for next year. I think, honestly, and I know it's easy to say this now because Rutgers has a losing record and hopefully they can make a run here this week. And, of course, if they made a miracle run and won the Big Ten tournament, I would choose that any day of the week and twice on Sunday over any other alternative. However, if they do not make the postseason, there could be – it could be looked at and we could look back on it as a blessing in terms of Rutgers getting a jump on reconstructing the roster for next season because there is no um, waiting period for teams, you know, that are in the postseason versus not to start rebuilding the roster. So when your season is over and it could be over as early as Wednesday, Rutgers can start making decisions right away. And having a jump on it could be a serious competitive advantage in terms of identifying and potentially landing transfers to come in through the portal to be on this team next year. You know the five recruits are coming, obviously headlined by Ace Bailey and Dylan Harper. Nathan Somerville is looking like a player that's going to be in the rotation. You know, Bryce Storch has had a good year. Uh, Dylan Grant's the fifth recruit coming. He has not been playing this year. So you have the five recruits. We, we know it's college basketball. Basketball, we know next year is going to be the last COVID year. So there's still going to be 23 and 24 year olds playing in college basketball, including the Big Ten. And you cannot rely on a Fab Five type situation. Not that Rutgers even has that. Who from the current roster will return? You know, it's uh, there's plenty of speculation. I think, you know, Cliff, Cliff Amore pretty much, I mean, if you if you take his his quotes for face value, Right. I mean, he's basically saying he's, he's not coming back. He said that he hasn't made a decision. However, he was very emotional before the game. And he said, this wasn't how I wanted to play my last game here. I just want to say I'm really sorry for going out this way. I just want to say to Rutgers fans, thank you for showing up in, in regard to hearing one more year. It shows me they want me. They've always supported me. I know I don't know my decision yet, but I appreciate them showing love. So, yes, he could return. I think it's looking unlikely for him to return. I don't think uh, – I, I, I think with NIL and the portal and players wanting to explore their value, their options are greater, and it depends on the player, depends on their skill set. But Cliff is going to have options. It's not just pro, pro-driven, pro right? I mean, he's got an extra year. He could go play anywhere in college. So we'll see what happens there. Same thing with Moat Mag, hasn't played uh, – in a while, dealing with a calf injury, it's been reported. Steve Pico really hasn't spoken about him uh, in, recently. You know, talking about seniors, you know, he didn't even mention them. So, will he return? I think at this point it looks unlikely. So, the roster is going to look very different next year, I think. And I, 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 my greater point, I guess, I don't know if it's my greater point. I think my greater point is that Pico. The most important priority, I know everybody is upset about the offense. The number one priority in the offseason is not the offense. The number one priority in the offseason is roster reconstruction. Building a roster with more talent that fits together on the court. That is, by far, not even close, the number one priority for this staff. Yes, they have to fit the culture of the program. But your offense improves with the right personnel with the right talent that fit together and can play in a cohesive manner. And you can have the best schemes in the world. If you don't have shooters, if you don't have talent, you're not going to be a high scoring offense. So I think Michael's comments are encouraging. I think they're going to figure things out pretty quickly in terms of who's saying who's not. And I honestly, I mean this respectfully to everyone on the current roster. But I don't think there's one player on the roster that is, oh, my gosh, if they leave, that's the worst news ever, and they're irreplaceable. Everyone's replaceable. And that goes for any industry, any business. I, I have learned that and believe that for a long time in my own career, that anyone is replaceable. 
And I think that that's also a change in mindset for everyone, for fans, for coaches. And I think players have to understand that too. In this day and age, I mean, you know, th there are options everywhere and it just, it goes both ways. It's not just for, co uh, for players, it's for coaches too, in terms of how they build their roster. And I think that's key is that if guys, you know, how will Pike will determine who's leaving, who's staying, and how does he manage those decisions in terms of, you know, entering the portal? Coaches handle it differently. You know, they automatically lose a spot. Some give them a window to, to potentially return. Jerome Tang talked about that at Kansas State last year. Um, so it's going to be very interesting. You know, in the, in the past, I mean, as of last year, it's changed so fast. I mean, allowing guys to have time to make a decision with the early entry NBA deadline, which is, I believe it was like June 1st. First May 30, something like that last year. You know, I've seen criticism of Pykele that, that he let Paul linger too long. So this is another thing. We don't know the conversations that happen behind the scenes, right? But again, this goes to last year. When, people, when, when things aren't announced, people automatically assume decisions aren't made. Decisions get made all the time that are not announced. Look at Jermichael Davis, who signed normally uh, in, in the – signing period last year and Rutgers never announced it. Like it was, it was, I think July, maybe it eventually came out. Um, you know, Dylan Harper, he signed in November and then it came out just last weekend that he actually signed in November. So you can't look at it. This is not checkers. This is chess. This is 3d 4d. You know, uh, this is, uh, you have to look at it with eyes wide open. I think it also goes for when you hear things or see things or rumors or, you know, all of a sudden, I mean, you know, people tweeting about Rutgers. I mean, it's going to be the microscope for Rutgers next year is going to be massive. And you're going to see national media guys. You're going to see guys come out of the woodwork on Twitter, on social media with, you know, rumors or, or inside knowledge and saying, and I'm not, you know, listen, I'm, not, I, I'm really not talking about like our own Rutgers recruiting sites, 24 seven sports rivals. The, those guys all do, you know, work hard do a good job reporting. I'm talking about when you start seeing someone all of a sudden start tweeting about Rutgers and, and, and having, you know, inside knowledge and talking about who they're pursuing and all this stuff. I mean, there's going to be a lot of that. And, you know, one thing you have to consider, and, and, and I, I think someone that talks about this so eloquently is uh, a, a previous guest of the Scarlet Faithful podcast, Curry Hicks age. If you, if you know him on Twitter, he does search season, which is phenomenal content. I, I love listening to his episodes. Just so I'm a college uh, basketball head coaching searches around the sport, and it's fascinating stuff. But he always talks about, um, you know, how to interpret things that are reported, you know, whether it's from national media, whether it's rumor mill, who put it out there, why did they put it out there, what's the motive. And uh, so if you haven't listened to search season with Curry Hicks Sage, you definitely should. But I think you have to look at that as well with, with you know, how the offseason is going to go. You know, who Rutgers is pursuing, who they're not pursuing, who's going to stay, who isn't going to stay. You know, I think nothing should be surprising at this point. I don't think there's anyone that you that 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 could that could leave that is devastating. I think the way the roster. I think an open mind with Pykele and the staff and kind of starting the puzzle over. I mean, I hope some guys stay, right? I think the most likely for obvious reasons is Jermichael Davis, who's had a, a better than expected freshman year. And his relationship with Ace Bailey makes you think he's he's a lock to stay. I think Emmanuel Bole, you know, uh, he played well yesterday, but, you know, coming off knee surgery, has only played a few games, you know, only has a Juco tape besides Rutgers, um, you know, he, of course, could leave, but I, I think he's more likely to stay than not. And then everybody else, you know, I mean, listen, I, I hope Gavin comes back. I hope uh, that I think he's shown a lot of progress and he could have a big role next season. But anyone that says, oh, he's definitely coming back, you don't know that. that, that you, you just can't say that. And I think, again, it goes back to value because – Values are going to go up for guys as the offseason goes. As, as guys fall off the board, other guys that are still on the board or not even on the board that teams are interested in, their value is going to go up. So that's going to be the, the slippery slope that Steve Peichel and the staff are going to have to manage. It's going to be very difficult to manage because it's like facing an invisible opponent. You know, who's trying to poach who? 
And uh, I, I think the encouraging thing is that their eyes are wide open. I think they're not oblivious to it anymore. I think that it's not about, uh, I, I, I think they're, they're going to be a lot more proactive in prioritizing who they have to lock up and ensuring that they're here and then building the roster through opportunity. You know, all eyes are going to be on Rutgers next year. Every NBA scout is going to be watching Rutgers. That's a huge selling point for transfers. Um, playing with two future lottery picks is a big sell. NIL is certainly going to be a factor, but I think it's exciting. I think it's very exciting to see what's going to happen here. But I think without without fail, the most important part of the offseason is the roster reconstruction. Michael saying what he said on Sunday after the game in terms of his changing his approach him understanding he needs to figure out who's staying, who's leaving right away. The fact that Rutgers is trending towards not being in the postseason. The fact that Rutgers, I think, is going to be much more prepared going into this offseason. I think if they do wait on guys, it's going to be an agreement or, or more structure to it. Um, and I think, you know, again, guys are going to leave. That's just part of the, 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 the norm in college basketball now. It's not an indictment on Rutgers if, you know, half the roster leaves, most of the roster leaves. You know, I mean, leaving for your fifth year, you know, go somewhere else, it's pretty common now. So people that want to read into whatever they want to read into, I think people are going to believe what they want to believe. I think we've seen the culture that Steve Pike has built. I think we've seen his ability to get – I mean, look at Gavin with his improvement on the defensive end. And, yes, the offense, th there needs to be some changes. There needs to be some improvements. But, I mean, yesterday was a great example of how many open shots that they miss. Uh, that's not a, a problem in offensive scheme. Uh, you need shooters. And I'm a big proponent. I think, depending on how many spots open up, you need to get legit shooters. Uh, obviously, Gavin could be a great shooter for this team. But you need shooters. In modern college basketball, you need guys that can hit threes. You know, the, the, the mid-range game is, is again, we're talking about value, has the least amount of value compared to, to shots at the rim and three-point shots. You need shooters. Dylan Harper is going to be your floor general. He's going to be your creator. I think Pico has been looking for the ultimate floor general, playmaker, at point guard since his arrival. And I think he's found him in Dylan Harper. That's going to have a huge influence on things. You know, he's not going to come in and be a score first 25 point scorer. You know, he is, he's shown at the EYBL level. He's shown uh, for Team USA. He is a distributor. He can score, uh, you know, at a very high clip. He's a very dynamic offensive player, but he is a distributor, facilitator, a guy that can run the offense. And it's really exciting. And, and, and guys are going to want to get in the portal and play with players like that. And there's going to be a ton of buzz. So I think things are wide open. I think be careful what you latch on to in terms of rumors, in terms of who's reporting it, why are they reporting it, what are they saying, whose camp is putting that out there, right? I, those are all things you have to think about. And I think that things are going to take off pretty quick when the season's over. So be ready, buckle up, and thanks for listening. Once again, here at the Scarlet Fade.